It's good to see you back all, all back here this evening. The last few weeks we've been doing a series on Sunday nights about the, the problem of sin. And we've looked at, you know, how sin is definitely a problem. It's the greatest, probably the greatest problem that mankind faces or has faced throughout the history of mankind. And, and we've looked at some of the reasons for that. And then we've been looking at some of the things that are not necessarily sins, uh, but that can lead to sin. And tonight we're going to uh, continue that, uh, that series. And uh, last week we looked at uh, the issue of arrogance. And uh, so tonight we're going to look at this, at the idea of curiosity. And for our young people, because I never know what, what y'all have heard throughout your lives or not, but there's an old saying that, you know, my grandmother and my mother used to say, um, when I was being just a little too curious, and that is that curiosity killed the cat. And uh, so thus the title of the lesson tonight is Curiosity Only Bad for Cats. Uh, and so we're going to talk about uh, this idea of curiosity and the role that it can play in whether we sin or whether we don't sin. And so before we get to, you know, really the meat of the lesson, let's, let's just define what it is that we're talking about when we talk about curiosity. Um, and this is just a dictionary definition that I've pulled out from somewhere. Uh, but it, it's uh, the desire to learn or know about anything. Inquisitiveness. Asking questions. Being curious. An interest that leads to inquiry. So, you know, sure or false, curiosity is only dangerous for cats. Well, we're going to look at that tonight. Uh, because we're going to see, I think, that curiosity is not just dangerous for cats, it can be dangerous for us as well. Curiosity in and of itself is not a sin, but it can sure get us there. And so we'll talk about that. And, you know, because, again, that's the second question, true or false, not all curiosity is bad. And that is true. Not all curiosity is bad. So tonight we want to see how curiosity can either influence us to sin or it can influence us to good. And so that's where we're headed tonight with this lesson on this subject. And the first thing that I want us to understand without a doubt is that curiosity is a God-given trait. It is something that God has put into each and every one of us. And I want you to go back over to Acts, the 17th chapter, to the passage that Brother Ken read for us tonight. Uh, and what we have here is Paul is in Athens, and he is looking around, and he sees all of the different temples and, and, and memorials and everything else set up to all uh, of, the, uh, of the false gods. And it says there in verse 16 of Acts chapter 17 that his spirit was provoked. He was stirred up when he saw that the city was given over to idols. And so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers. But I, and I don't know if, if Paul knew about this beforehand, but what we see in verse 21 is that the Athenians were a very curious people. It says, all of the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else either to tell or to hear some new thing. They were curious, always curious, to hear something new. So you know what that did for Paul? That opened up an opportunity. An opportunity to use the curiosity of the Athenians for good. He used that opportunity to talk about the existence of of the unknown God, because they had a temple set up to the unknown, just in case they missed one, 
They had a temple set up for the unknown God, and Paul used that to show them who that unknown God. And so in his explanation, and we're not going to reread it because Ken did a great job, but he talks about how it's, it's man's God-given curiosity that causes him to seek God. Look at verse 27. He has pre-appointed the times and the boundaries of the dwellings of man, verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one. Why does anybody seek anything? It's out of curiosity. It's because they want to find something. So it's man's curiosity then, this God-given trait, that causes him to ask some of the most important questions in his quest for God. How did I get here? What am I doing here? What is my purpose? And where am I going? Where did those questions come from? but our innate curiosity. That thing that God has put within us to ask questions and to be curious and try to find answers. But it's when man begins to use his God-given traits to pursue evil that they lead him into sin. Just a couple of examples. Think about the God-given trait, and it is, we don't like to talk about it too much. The sexual desire. That is something that God has put in to each and every one of us. It's a God-given characteristic of mankind, and it's wholesome, and it's good when it's used like God intended it, within the confines of marriage. But that same God-given trait becomes sinful when it's used outside the marriage relationship. And you, okay, here's one that is not so controversial. Hunger. Don't we all get hungry? Isn't that a feeling or a, a something that God gives us all? It's useful and it's needful for us to maintain our strength and the health of our bodies. The feeling of hunger. But it becomes sinful when we use it to engage in gluttony, <laughs> because gluttony is a sin. And so we can see how, just like sexual desire, just like hunger, Satan can use our curiosity to lead us into sin. And again, I can't think of a much better example than going back to the very beginning. In the garden, with Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3, verses 4, and six, 4 through 6. The serpent said to the woman, after she told him, God said, in the day that you eat of the, the, the fruit of that tree, you shall surely die. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that it was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Eve didn't seem to have much interest in the fruit of that tree until the serpent came along and started talking to her about it. And he piqued her interest. He piqued her curiosity. And isn't that the way kind of things work sometimes? Something forbidden kind of leads to increased curiosity. Ooh, it's mysterious. Let's find out a little bit more about that. God had forbidden eating of the tree. But what Satan did is he came along and he minimized the consequences and he highlighted the benefits. And he's been doing it ever since. 
because that increased Eve's curiosity and her desire to learn more about what God had forbidden. And when that curiosity was piqued, it led her to sin. And again, as I said, Satan has been doing the same thing since the beginning. He will minimize the consequences of sin and highlight the perceived benefits to pique our curiosity, to try to get us to sin. If you go over with me to Romans chapter 7, we're going to see that, as I said, Satan hasn't changed his tactics. Over in Romans, the seventh chapter, beginning in verse 7 here, Paul is speaking about how the Old Testament law brought an increased awareness of sin. Read with me in Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 7. It says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law said you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Again, as, as I said, what Paul is talking about here is how the Old Testament law brought an increase in the awareness of sin. It taught the Jews what sin was, specifically what God said sin was. But hopefully you heard the inflection in my voice as I read verses 8 and 11. Because Paul is really telling us that a lot of times something that is forbidden can lead to an increased curiosity, which can happen if we don't have the proper attitude about sin. If we don't see sin as disgusting and as abhorrent as God sees it, then our curiosity is more likely to lead us to pursuing those things that are forbidden. We've got to have the proper attitude towards sin so that even when we're curious about it, it doesn't lead us to sin. Because we can remember, oh no, wait a minute, God hates that. God thinks that's disgusting. God can't even look at that. That's the attitude that we need to have. And I want, I want, some, I want you to understand too, because I think this is a misperception. I'm not talking about that God finds people disgusting and abhorrent. What he finds is their sin disgusting and abhorrent and, and we need to have the same we need to have compassion on people but we also need to have a proper attitude toward the sins that they may commit and we need not become curious by the lifestyle that they are leading and let it lead us into sin I think we miss the mark sometimes on our compassion and our, our, our love toward people because of our attitude towards sin. That's, that's a different lesson. We'll, we'll talk about that some other time. So let's talk about the danger of just one sin. As, I, as I've already mentioned, Satan, one of the tactics, one of his main tactics is to minif minimize the consequences of sin. It's not really that bad. It's not as bad as people make it out to be. And look at all the good that, that can come from it. Look at all the pleasure you can get from it. 
But the way that he does that, the way that he tries to minimize the consequences of sin, first of all, is by telling us the lie no one else will know. You can do this in the privacy of your own home, out of the public eye, and no one else will know. What's wrong with that? Someone else will know. Because God will know. And if our minds and our consciences have been trained right, we'll know. And our consciences will convict us as well. But even if no one else knows, someone else will know. God will know. And he's the most important one when it comes to who will know. This is, the next one is the one that's probably the most popular. It won't hurt anyone. Or, I'm not hurting anyone else by doing what I'm doing. Again, what's wrong with that kind of reasoning? It may not necessarily hurt someone else, but it's hurting one person. If I commit that sin, it's hurting me. It's damaging my soul. It's damaging my relationship with God. But I said, even if it doesn't affect anyone else, there's no such sin that doesn't affect anyone else. Because no sin is committed in a vacuum. Someone else will always be affected, whether it's now or down the road. Someone else will always be affected. And thirdly, and I think this is where Maybe, probably the one that our young people need to be the most aware of is the lie that Satan tells that says there's always time to change later. I can do this now while I'm young because I've, all, I've got a whole life in front of me to change. But what's wrong with that? I would guess that probably every person in this room, when you were in elementary school, or junior high, or high school, or early college, you knew of at least one person, one young person in your class or in your town that didn't live to see 20. I know of several. I, I'm aware of several. In just in, in my so what's wrong with this is that we're not guaranteed the next hour, much less the next day. To have such an attitude that I have time to change later goes against everything that the scripture says. Over in James chapter 4 and verse 14. James says, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And over in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, we always, almost always use this verse in context of when we give the invitation. Paul said, Behold, now is if you're not a Christian, today is the day of salvation. Today's the day to do it. But I think we can use it another way. 
And that is, if you're being tempted to sin, if your curiosity has been piqued by the temptation to sin, remember, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to do the right thing because you don't have, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. So don't fall for Satan's lies. When he tries to say, do it because no one will know, it won't hurt anyone, or do it now that you can change later. Because one sin can have everlasting consequences. You remember over in Acts chapter 5 when a lot of the new Christians that were in Jerusalem were selling their property and they were bringing the proceeds to the apostles. This man and his wife by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. And they sold their land for a certain price. But then when they brought the money to the apostles, they basically said, we sold it for less so that they could keep the extra. So they lied. They lied about what they had done. Do you remember what happened to Ananias pretty much the minute the lie was out of his mouth? He fell down dead. And when Sapphira came in later and the apostles asked her, did you sell the land for such and such? Yes, that's how much we sold the land for. Some of, the, some of the scariest words that I've ever heard. Peter said, Behold, the feet of those who carried your husband out are waiting at the door to carry you out too. Because she fell down dead too. It's the consequences of one sin. One sin can have eternal consequences. And if you remember over in Acts, the 8th chapter, with Simon the sorcerer. And let's just go over there, because I want us to see what the state of Simon was after one sin, the one sin of trying to buy the ability to lay his hands on people to pass on the Holy Spirit. Over in Acts, chapter 8, Verse 20, Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. One sin. And Simon had placed his eternal soul in jeopardy. And let's go over to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What we need to remember from this passage is that depending upon the condition of our heart, and I think that's, that's part of it, but every sin puts our souls in jeopardy. You know, we have, or I'm not going to speak, I'm not going to say we, I'm going to say me. I have enough trouble Avoiding sin in those areas where I know I'm weak. I know there are some areas where I struggle. And 
Brethren, there are some times when I just have a hard time overcoming those things that I am very aware about. Now, why would we want to place a further burden on ourselves by pursuing sins just because we're curious about them? Why would we want to do that? When we already know what we struggle with, why are we going to add a further burden to ourselves? Let's not do that. And also what we learn is that one sin can lead to further entanglement. It's like Have any fishermen in this in this anybody that's ever run a trot line running for catfish and you're pulling up those hooks and you get stuck on one of those hooks on the trot line and you start flailing around trying to get that one hook out before long before you know it you got all those hooks in you you're just all entangled in that trot line well that's what one sin can cause. One sin can lead to further entanglement. Look with me at 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. While they promised them liberty, Peter's talking about false teachers here. He said they promised liberty. They themselves are slaves of corruption, for by whom a person is overcome, by him he's also brought into bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they're again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. So again, as I said, Peter here is talking about false teachers and those that follow after them. But he shows us that, that sin, any sin, can lead to further entanglement and more sin. What may begin as curiosity can become habit and addiction. How many people, and I'm, I'm thinking especially of my dad's generation, how many kids do you know of that started out smoking because they were just curious or they thought it just looked really cool? So they smoked that first cigarette. And it might have made them a little sick, but you know, ah, oh, that was just one. So let's try it again. Before you know it, what happened? 50 years down the line, got a five pack a day habit so this is a, you know one bout of curiosity can become a habit and sometimes an addiction and then Peter says the last state becomes worse than the first we'll skip over Hebrews chapter 10 because I, 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 I harp on that one way too much but I want us to think about 2 Samuel chapter 11 and the case of David. Note that David went out on his rooftop at night and he looked down and he saw a woman bathing on her rooftop. What do you suppose it was that led David to gaze upon this woman as she was bathing? Curiosity. He saw something he didn't normally see. And he went to look. He was curious. No doubt a large, not all, I'm sure, but a large part of it, no doubt, was curiosity. But what I want you to remember is where that curiosity led David. It led him to inquiring after another man's life. It led him to committing adultery, to getting a man drunk, and ultimately having that man killed. Because he was curious about that woman that he saw on the rooftop. 
One curious glance where his gaze had no business wandering led to all of that sin. And it ultimately led to the death of a child. And it led to him having the kingdom taken away from him. All of these things cost David from one curious glance. So, curiosity is not a sin that's worth our time. We should know enough, know all that we need to know about the destructiveness of sin from personal experience. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands tonight, but I want you to think about this. How many of you have committed sins in your life that you're still feeling the consequences from? or that had very serious consequences in your life at one point. We should already know all we need to know about what sin can do without trying some new sin to see how destructive it is. Romans 3.23 Wages of sin is death, all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans says as well. We should know about the destructiveness of sin from others. If we can't learn from our own sins, maybe we can learn from the sins of other people. Because how many of us know someone who has committed sins that have practically destroyed their lives? I think we all do. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. All of these things, he's talking about the Israelites here. All of these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. If you don't know anybody personally who's been affected by the destructiveness of sin, read the Old Testament. And let me introduce you to some people who have the Israelites because they did it over and over and over. And we should also already know that the satisfaction and the pleasure of sin is temporary. We talked last week over in Hebrews chapter 11 where it talks about Moses, how he forsook the passing pleasures of sin to suffer with his people. Moses knew that sin, the pleasure we get from sin is only temporary. But the consequences of sin, consequences of sin are eternal. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. And I, 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 I do this all the time. I mix up 6.23 and 3.23. But Paul says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. It may feel good now, but boy, when the paycheck comes, it's not going to be fun. But not all curiosity is bad. You think about the Jews on Pentecost. Where would the people on Pentecost be without the curiosity to ask, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Their curiosity led to something very, very good. Where would the Ethiopian eunuch be without the curiosity to know more about God's word? He was reading from Isaiah, and Philip said, Do you understand what you're reading? He said, How can I? Unless someone got me. He had the curiosity to ask for help, to learn more about God's Word. And so we need to be the same way. The curiosity we need to feed is not the curiosity for sin, but it's the curiosity to know more about God and to know more 
about his word. Remember what Paul said to, to Timothy over in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. To be, to, in order to present ourselves approved of a God, to be able to rightly divide the word of truth, is going to take a curiosity about the word of truth. It's going to take an application to the word of truth in order to be acceptable to God. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. You know what else we need to be curious about? We need to be curious about other people. Not to get to know their what you know the lifestyles that are sinful that they may lead. But we need to get curious about other people and get to know them better so that we can share the word with them. Not so we can share in their sin. We need to be curious about our brethren. We need to get to know them so that we can know better how to serve one another. And I, I mean, I'm speaking to the choir on this one because I think you all do a wonderful job of that, of taking care of one another because you know one another. Don't ever let that curiosity die, though. To know each other better and to serve each other better. But we need to find ways to satisfy our curious spirits in ways that bring further glory and honor to God more so than in ways that are going to carry us further away from God. Don't be fooled by the bells and the whistles and the shininess and Glitter that Satan puts on sin. But be curious about the glory of God. Be drawn to the glory, the majesty, the power, the awesomeness of God. Let your curiosity be fed there. And we'll do all right. So, that's all I've got for tonight. But, there may be someone here tonight whose curiosity has led them to a point where they're ready to become a child of God. And if you have reached that point, if you, are, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, if you are ready to confess that, repent of your sins, and be baptized, God has promised to take away your sins at that point. And we are ready to and eager to help you do that tonight. Or if you're one of our brothers and sisters already, but you've kind of had some issues with letting your curiosity get the best of you, and there is something that we can help you with, you will find prayerfulness, you will find love, you will find compassion and mercy for whatever it is you need. So we offer that opportunity as well tonight. Whatever your need may be, we invite you to let us know how we can help as we sing this invitation song.